Hey there, welcome back to Farmcraft. We got something else to work on today. This is not the generator that I installed a few months ago. That was a 24 kilowatt and it's, actually we haven't had a power outage. Never used it, but um, it's working fine. This is a free generator. Um, my buddy was on a job site and this was installed and they said it had quit making power. The engine still ran, but it wouldn't make power. So it sat idle for a period of time and they gave it to him for free. And he brought it over to me to see if I could fix it. He's actually the same guy who poured this concrete slab for me many years ago. And uh, we've got two things going on. So, as usual, when you're uninstalling something that doesn't work, it gets the old snipper treatment. And all these wires come to this control panel here. So this is a battery charger. Press to test. This is your mode. Standby off. And then it's got indicator lights like low oil, high temperature, over crank. So this is basically your control panel for the engine. So the first issue is the engine has no spark. There's three coils, three cylinders, no spark. Uh, so we're gonna need to fix that. And then we're gonna need to see what the generator is doing. And I've been researching them a little bit and there's kind of some interesting things in how they work. Uh, I think this is gonna be cool to go through, but first priority, let's figure out why we don't have any spark. I suspect we essentially have a kill circuit that is activated, um, probably because of this. But let's see what I can figure out. So I did put three spark testers on it and cranked it. There's no spark. Um, but let's have a look around the engine before we confirm that again. Here's our intake. There was obviously a, a hose that came from this filter to there. And this is, it runs off of propane. This is a propane line coming in there. Now this is a Daihatsu engine manufactured in Japan with a Vanguard, a Briggs & Stratton Vanguard sticker on it. Probably not uncommon, but not something I've seen before. See, we've got three coils, one for each cylinder and no spark anywhere. So one of the first things I always wanna check is the oil because a low oil sensor will give you no spark. And the oil looks good. Yeah, it looks barely even run. See how clean that is? You know, radiator coolant. We'll verify all the fluids before we start tinkering too far. If I do get it running, I wanna make sure I don't mess anything up. Yep, we got coolant, nice and green. Has a new battery, and the way it's cranking right now is jumping the starter solenoid straight to hot. Starter sounds plenty strong, battery strong. Let's see if we can figure out this spark issue. Let's verify that we're not getting any spark. Whole lot of nada. Let me get this guy out of my way. I think this is where my money's gonna be. Let's see, so this is this is just a battery charger here. It's input 115 volts, output 12 volts. So this goes over to the battery to charge it, and this comes in, this wire comes along here, goes into this panel here that you guys can't see, and that's where the grid power would come in to keep the battery topped off. This thing is like really annoying. There's nowhere to put it. So I'm going to disconnect this just to get it out of my way. All right, disconnected that. I don't know where this thing was mounted. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. They're labeled. It says one is start. So that's probably energizing the starter solenoid. Three and four are ground and 12 volts. Hmm. Maybe all this thing needs is power. Certainly could be. So then there's test mode and standby. And then, so this switch has three positions, but it says reset and off, I guess are the middle position. Yeah, off reset is the same thing. So that stops system immediately. Well, that's probably sending a kill signal. Standby, start system using external controls connected to TS1. What's TS1? I'm pretty sure that's terminal strip one, this connection right here. And then test is start system from this control panel. So 
I imagine that that would start it. But since this thing doesn't have any power, I don't think cranking it now is going to make any difference. But let's try it. I think I just need to energize this thing. Still got my spark testers on there. Nada. Okay. Yeah, I think I just need to hook these wires up. So I must say I'm a little confused. I mean, if these were just hooked to 12 volt DC and then the other one was hooked to starter, why aren't they still hooked up? What was this attached to that got cut? Did they have some kind of external 12 volt power supply? Because there's no like cut wires over at the battery. That's odd. Wouldn't you expect the starter should be hooked to the starter solenoid and the positive negative should be hooked to the battery? But I've learned sometimes you assume things to be logical and that's your first mistake. Don't assume logic. Okay, there were two wires just doing nothing. The original wires it says number two and number five, so. Yep. Well, now that's weird. That's really weird. Look at this. Number four, 12 volts DC positive. This wire is labeled number four. It's in position number four, yet it's green. The one right beside it, number three, is negative 12 volts DC, which is a stupid way to put it. And then it says ground in parentheses. This is wire number three. It's in position three, but it's red. Huh? Uh, what was I saying about logic? <laughs> you can also see, you know, this red one, the ground, continues in green. This green one, the hot, continues in red. <laughs> what in the world? All right, I, I can't take it. So I'm gonna scrape the four and the three off of these wires and I'm gonna flip them. It's gotta happen. Red to red, how about that? It's a novel idea. And green to green. See, now when I'm on the other side of the machine and I don't have the panel in front of me, I don't accidentally hook the green to the wrong one, which is exactly what I would want to do. So obviously this isn't a permanent connection. Don't worry, it's only temporary. But this probably really is temporary. If I get this thing working, I'll put some proper ring terminals on here. Nothing's caught on fire yet. I don't have the start wire hooked up. Putting it in test mode should not do anything. But I did hear a relay click. I bet you it'll start. Oh, uh, that's going to be your external control box. That's going to be your signal to tell it, hey man, start up. Yeah, this sent the 12 volt signal to the starter solenoid through this. I kind of like to see my spark lights actually work. Okay, so the reason it didn't start right there is because it doesn't have any fuel. That'll do it. So let's get some starting fluid and see if this thing will pop off. Okay, so this thing's gonna start cranking here. And I'm gonna spray starting fluid in the intake. I think we got a runner. Well, now I need to figure out how to hook it to propane. Now you can't run this thing on a grill tank. You know, you might get it to sputter and start, but it's gonna, it's gonna run out of fuel very quickly. There's enough gallons of fuel in this, of liquid propane, to run it for a period of time, but there's not enough vapor. And propane appliances run off of vapor. And that vapor requires surface area of propane to gas, to the vapor section. And as it converts from liquid to gas, it gets cold, which reduces the amount of conversion you get. So basically you would freeze this tank up very quickly and the generator wouldn't run right. Um, and then it would just quit running because it wasn't getting enough fuel. So you need a bigger tank. And by the way, that's why you often see propane tanks oriented sideways because it increases that liquid to vapor surface area. That increases its ability to produce vapor. This is actually the hookup for the propane, and that is a half-inch pipe thread. Turns out I have a fitting for it that goes to a half-inch flare, and that 
will go to, I put a flex line on my old propane tank that I've moved down here to the shop. You guys remember when I put in that 500 gallon underground propane tank? Well, this is my old 120. So I can now use this for my foundry furnaces and forge and all that kind of stuff. And I put a quick connect there. So I've actually got a real propane supply for this thing. And I uh, just have to do a couple of fittings, which I have on hand, and I should be able to hook it up. So let's get it done. Well, this is disappointing. I just turned the gas on and there was a significant leak coming from this regulator here. I mean, I came over to it, heard it like rushing out, and so I just went and turned it off. So, let's see, I'm gonna need to figure out if I can put air to this thing, that would be better, and then I can find out what's going on with the leak. This is half inch pipe to quarter inch pipe. Coupling. And that goes to a Schrader valve, so I can Pump it up with air, check the pressure, whatever I need to from that. Check it out, I found a little air gauge that I could put in line too. So then when I pump it up, I can see how fast it's leaking down, how much pressure I'm putting to it, all that kind of stuff. That's interesting. Does not seem to be leaking like it was. That's what it was doing. Look at that. There's your problem, lady. I thought that was just a swivel, but that is a left-hand thread to an O-ring. I think that was my issue. Stupid. All right, well that was definitely my major leak, but it's still not holding pressure. I pump it up to 100 and it comes down. So I got soapy water here. Let's, uh, let's check all our joints, including my test rig. Yeah, maybe it's leaking out there. That'll be good if it's just my test rig that's leaking. Soapy water is remarkably effective at this. So, you, know, you can see all the little bubbles there. That's a that's a leaking. This one might have leaked a little bit. I don't think that one did. That one looks good. No bubbles. That one has a few bubbles on top. But the real leak is coming from my test rig. So I'll tighten that up a little bit more. And uh, but I think we're good to go ahead and run this thing. I'll tell my buddy. He might want to replumb this thing when he installs it, which he'd probably do anyway. All right, that looks better. All right, now hopefully this thing's going to start and run because it now has propane coming to it. I've got a meter here and I'm going to check the, this is the output voltage of the generator right there when it starts cranking and see what I've got. See if I've got anything at all. Well, let's see what happens. it would have to crank for a while because the propane lines aren't full. I'll hit it with, uh, with a little starting fluid to help it when it cranks next time. I turned that to off and it did not do anything. I turned it to standby, it also didn't do anything. So, um, hmm, how are you supposed to turn this thing off? What I did is I went over and I turned off the propane. And of course that did something. For power output, I had like 70 volts between both legs, 19 
volts on one leg and then 54 on the other when I tested each leg to ground. Something's not happy in there. So behind this guy is where we're going to start. Looks to me like we've got leg one here, leg two here, and then this one's neutral. So I want to ohm from leg to neutral on both of them and see how we look. I also want to ohm from this to ground, which ground is going to be the case. Yeah, see there's a ground wire going right there, hooked to the case. So I should not have any continuity to the case, obviously. And um, I'm curious to see how many ohms I'm going to get from each leg to neutral. If they're the same, that is good news for the stator. So, I mean, basically these things all work with the same general principle. And uh, take this with a grain of salt. I don't work on generators, but um, there is a stator, the stationary part uh, that has a bunch of coils in it. And then there's a rotor that's spinning inside the stator. And typically the rotor is a magnet of some kind. It can be an electromagnet, it can be a permanent magnet. So the rotor needs to have intact coils to, gener to become an electromagnet and generate a magnetic field. And these need to have intact coils to basically generate the voltage. So we're gonna do some ohming and see what the status of the stator is, what the status of the rotor is. And I know one thing that does fail on generators a lot is the voltage regulator, which I'm pretty sure that's what that is. And these two wires here, well, those are female spade connectors, but I don't see any male spade connectors. It's not like they came disconnected. Probably never hooked up, but I'm not sure what they would be for. So we go leg one. We get 0.3 ohms. And leg two. 0.3 ohms. So both legs are measuring the same. That's good. That's good news for the stator so far. So now let me go leg one to ground. Uh oh. Wait, that's mega ohms and it's going up. So that was capacitance is what it was measuring right there. And now it's measuring nothing. So I think I'm good there. Leg two to ground, nothing. So that's good news. All right, let's talk about the basics of what you need to know about generators in order to diagnose and fix them. Now, disclaimer, this is from a jack of all trades. I'm gonna oversimplify a lot of things. I'm gonna generalize. I might get some things a little bit wrong, but this is just the basic practical stuff that's gonna help you. If I learn something I usually do from the comments, I will post it in the description if I need to make a correction or anything. We're gonna start very basic and we'll build up quickly, so bear with me. If you have a wire and a magnet, if you move the magnet near the wire, you're moving a magnetic field near a conductor that induces a current in the conductor. So electricity and magnetism, electromagnetism, are kind of interchangeable. They're really two sides of the same thing. So a moving magnetic field, will induce a current. Likewise, a current running through a wire will induce a magnetic field around it. Both of those principles are used in these generators. Now, when you move a magnet near a wire like this, you're talking about microvolts or some ridiculously small amount. In order to magnify the effect, you put the wire in a coil. Now when I move the magnet past it, Instead of just moving past one wire, I'm moving it past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wires, and I'm getting seven times the induced current. So we're gonna deal with lots of coils. So now the easiest way to repeatedly move a magnetic field is rotational. Obviously going back and forth would be kind of silly and, and mechanically hard to build, but we can make things spin very easily. And that's what's in a generator. You've got an, a stationary coil, and you have a rotating magnet inside it. The stationary coil, stationary, is called the stator, and the rotating magnet inside it is called the rotor. The stator is what's connected to the electrical outlets. That's what you're plugging into. When you plug in, one of these is neutral and one of these is hot, or they're both hot if it's a 240 volt circuit. The very simplest generator you could build would be to just take a permanent magnet and spin it inside a coil, and that would work. Uh, would be very simple, very reliable. There's a problem though, and that is you need to have a magnet that you can adjust the magnetism. The strength of the rotating of the magnet that's in here rotating 
is what determines the voltage. So, I mean, actually, the coil, there's a lot of things, and the engineers have figured that all out. But basically, you need to be able to adjust it. And if you just put permanent magnets in there, you're going to have a generator that might put out 108 volts, and there's nothing you can do about that. It's 108 volts all the time, and that's not a good generator. You want a generator that's going to put out 120 volts. We need a magnet that is adjustable, and it turns out that's an electromagnet. Remember, we were talking about when you run current through a wire, it generates a magnetic field. Well, the more current, the more field. The less current, the less field. So we are going to have an electromagnet rotating inside a fixed coil, the stator. Let me show you. This is a motor, but these use much the same principle. And you've got, you can see a coil of wire here and a coil of wire down inside there. And that one rotates. So that internal coil that's rotating is the rotor coil. And this outside one that's fixed is the stator. So we have the stator figured out. It's a stationary coil and it has a magnet rotating inside it. The stator is what's connected to your plugs. Done. Now, how do we put an electromagnet inside the stator and be able to adjust it? So we are looking at a cross section now. So this area here is the stator and this area inside is the rotor. And we've got a couple other things going on. So coming further out on the rotor, we have a different section of it that's for a different purpose. This is called the exciter. So exciter just means it's generating the initial magnetism. If you just have this, a coil inside a coil, and nothing else and you spin it, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to generate any voltage. You're not going to have any resistance on spinning because there's no magnetic fields to interact with the coils. So you've got to generate that magnetic field. And getting it started is actually a thing. How do you start it? Well, a permanent magnet's a great way to start it, but like we said, you can't control a permanent magnet well. But if you just need a little bit of current, a permanent magnet generator is a great way to do it. So that's what you have in this pilot exciter. It's basically just a permanent magnet generator. You've got a north pole, a south pole, coils around it. And when the, the engine is over here, when the engine starts rotating all of this together, this is all one shaft, it's going to generate current, and we have it hooked to the automatic voltage regulator. This north and south pole magnet here is going to be rotating. Pick a section of coil. To this piece right here, initially north is coming towards it, and now north is on this side, and then north is going away from it and then north is coming towards it and then going away from it. So what that does is it, it's going to attract electrons and then repel electrons, attract them and re repel them. And what you get is an alternating current in here. You don't get like DC current out of a battery, direct current. You get alternating current. That alternating current gets sent to this AVR, automatic voltage regulator, and inside this is a rectifier. Big word, it's just a series of diodes. There's other ways to do it, but usually diodes that turns AC into DC, alternating current into direct current. So rather than the electrons bouncing back and forth, they just have a positive and negative like a battery. So now we have DC current in this automatic voltage regulator. Now, just an aside, you could do this with a battery. You just need DC current, but this is a good way to do it because it's always gonna be available. Batteries die, have to be replaced, all that kind of stuff. Now, we need to get this rotating coil of wire to be an electromagnet that we can adjust. So how do we get the DC current from this stationary thing? You know, this is out in the, in the still world, whereas we need it in here, inside there where it's rotating. So we need electricity to cross a pivot. If any of you saw my video on repairing the excavator swivel joint, it's much the same problem. How do you get the hydraulic fluid to cross a pivot? Well, we need electricity to cross a pivot. You use brushes and slip rings. And what that means is basically there's like a copper ring that's electrically isolated around the shaft, another one here, and those are free to spin, and they have brushes. The brushes are stationary and rub on the rings. So the electricity can flow from the wire to the brush, across the pivot to the rings, and then the rings have wires that go into the, into the rotor coil. So you can kind of see, you know, this would be a, a continuous ring of copper around here. It's electrically isolated, so it doesn't communicate with the shaft electrically, and it doesn't, you know, it's got insulators in between them. So there's one conductor there, and there's another conductor there, and they are hooked permanently to a wire here, and this wire would cross under 
and attach to this one. And that allows the brush to then attach to this rotating wire and this brush to this one or vice versa, but you get the point. So now we have DC current coming through our AVR, through the brushes, through the slip rings, into the rotor, and this is now an electromagnet. Now, why does it have to be DC current? Because we need a stable magnetic field, just like this. The north and south don't change. They're stable. If it was AC current, the field would be flipping back and forth while it's spinning, and you'd just have a mess. You need a stable magnetic field that rotates. Even though the magnet is based on electricity flowing, there's still going to be a north and a south. And in the stator coil, at one point you're going to have north coming towards you, north going away from you, north coming towards you, north going away from you. So you're going to generate AC current. And then you're, you're going to tap off wires out of that. And the way you get the proper voltage and everything is based on how this is engineered. We don't need to know any of that. The engineers figured all that out. There's coils, it's the stator, and out comes line one, neutral, line two. That's split phase power in North America. Uh, in other areas of the world, you're going to have different setups. You might just have a line one and a neutral, a 240 volt and a neutral. But we have 120 neutral, 120 with 240 between. This is a feedback. The voltage starts coming out of here. You want 120, say it's only 100. Well, the AVR is going to say, well, I'm not getting enough voltage, so let me increase the DC current that's going to the slip rings. It makes the magnetic field stronger, and you get more voltage out of this coil. It comes back at 110 volts. The AVR says we need more, and there's a feedback loop. You get up to 120 and maybe it overshoots. You get up to 125, the AVR backs off a little bit. So there's this constant dance to keep the voltage where the AVR is set to. And these AVRs actually have a potentiometer on them to fine tune where that voltage is. It's not just a, a strict setting. This is how most of the portable generators are set up. So this is a brushed generator setup, and there's a better way to do it. It's a little more complex, costs a little more, but it's more reliable and more efficient, and that is to eliminate the brushes. In order to do that, we need to replace the slip rings and the brushes with something else, and it's something you can't do in a hydraulic system. You take advantage of the properties of electromagnetism. This can be replaced with two coils, one on the rotor and one on the stator, and that would turn this into a brushless generator. The pilot exciter, north, south, this whole AC current, automatic voltage regulator and DC out are all exactly the same. This side, you've got DC current going into the generator, rotor, and the stator, and your power coming out feeding back to the AVR. Also, no change. So the only thing that we've done is remove the slip rings and the brushes, and we've replaced it with this. This is basically just a way to get DC power back into the generator rotor without actually touching the rotor. We have now a third section on our stator. We run the DC now through the static portion, the stator portion of the coil. The DC current running through here creates a magnetic field, and now we produce alternating current on the rotor coil. So we're just doing the opposite of what we're doing here. Here we're rotating a magnet on the inside, making alternating current on the outside. Now we're, we're running DC power, creating a magnet, on the outside, creating alternating current on the inside. That alternating current now won't work. Remember we were talking about, we need this to be DC, so we have to rectify it. Well, a rectifier is just something that changes AC into DC. It's usually done with diodes, it's not a big deal. Diodes are very robust pieces of electronic hardware. You can easily put it on a rotor and you can spin it at high RPM. It's not gonna hurt anything. So you actually put your rectifier right on the shaft and you convert the AC into DC right there. And then run it into the generator rotor and you got the same thing. Now we have a rotating magnetic field with DC power feeding the stator coils and giving us our voltage out. Feeds back to the automatic voltage regulator, but now adjusting the DC, it, it really does the same thing as it did in the brushed version. It's just two steps away. In the brushed version, the DC power went directly into the generator rotor after crossing the brushes and it could adjust the amount of this DC power to adjust the magnetic field. Here, the DC power goes into the stator, which then gets transmitted across the gap 
into the rotor as AC power. Well, the amount of AC power is going to determine the amount of DC power after it's rectified, and the amount of AC power is adjustable by adjusting this magnetic field. So it's basically just you're, you're kind of removed one step. You adjust the amount of DC power up, you're going to get more AC out, you're going to get more DC here, and you're going to get a stronger field. So here's something interesting. Brushes are a point of failure on these generators. They wear out, they have to be maintained, and generally brushless is going to be better and is going to last longer. On high-end portable generators and standby generators, they're usually going to be brushless. But when it comes to small portable generators, the brushed versions make better quality power. Even better are the inverter generators, but that's a topic for a different video. The brushless versions on a cheaper, smaller generator tend to put out very dirty power. So in general, on a small portable generator, you want brushed, and on a big standby generator, you want brushless. Why is that? I have no idea. But if you know, put a comment below. We'd all like to hear it. So after all of that, what is the point? What do we need to know here? Well, to fix a generator, there's the main things you need to check. The automatic voltage regulator is often a, course, uh, a cause of failure. Now that you kind of understand how these things work, you're going to know, okay, well, let's look at line one and line two coming out. Some smaller wires tapping off of it going over to this little box. That's going to be the automatic voltage regulator because the only other place these wires are going to go is, is to your load. It'll go to a breaker for protection and then to the plugs. So we're going to want to know what is the state of this stator coil, <laughs> the state of the stator. What is the condition of the stator coil? And it's pretty easy to tell. You check the resistance. When these things fail, they get hot, they burn up, a wire breaks, a connection breaks. In which case, if you hit hook a multimeter and you check resistance between line one and neutral here, if a wire is broken, you're going to have infinite resistance. It's going to be an open circuit. If something is shorted out and there's a direct connection from you know the beginning to the end or somewhere in the middle the insulation melted, these coils of wire are covered with an enamel insulation so that they're actually protected from each other. Like that, that's not a connection copper to copper there. You have to take the enamel off if you wanted to connect those together. But if it gets too hot and the enamel melts, now you've got a short, so the resistance will be too low, line one to neutral. You also want to check to ground. There should not be any connection between this and the case of the machine, which is going to be ground. Now you do have to be careful about that. On some machines you'll find at some point neutral and ground are tied together. Uh, it's down the line from this, so the machine works fine. But if they are tied together, your multimeter is going to find that connection and tell you that the coil is connected to ground. So if you find that neutral and ground are tied together and you want to check that, you need to disconnect that jumper and then check your coil to ground, which there should not be a connection internally between the coil and ground. And then you're also going to want to get to these brushes, inspect the brushes, check the resistance across the brushes, check the resistance from the slip rings through the rotor coil. Just with an ohm meter, you're going to be able to say, is the stator coil good? Or at least most of the time you will be correct, just checking ohms. And is the rotor coil good? You're also going to be able to tell that, especially on one with slip rings. Now, on these brushless ones, you may not have access to check the rotor coil, the main exciter coil, and these can, these can fail too. And if they do, probably you need a new power head because it's, it's just not something you're going to have access to. It's not something you're going to be able to fix. You can figure all that out on your machine if you want to. Find this AC line, check your resistance here, check this to ground, see if there's a short, that kind of thing. Same with this one. And the other thing is on a brushless is to check your diodes and see if any of the diodes have burned up because then you don't have a, an effective rectifier and it's not going to work. So that's what I was doing is checking the resistance on the stator coils. I don't see any evidence of a short or a broken wire. I also checked the stator coils to ground and found that they had no connection. And you also want to check for connection from one winding to any of the other windings on your machine to make sure that there's no fault there. I checked mine out and I did not find anything wrong with it, so I think the power head's good. So I'm sitting here doing the old visual inspection. This wire goes to this leg. This wire goes to this leg. And looking at it, that wire is bare right there. The insulation is missing. So that has probably allowed that leg to arc to the case. So that's no good. A big part of me wants to pull this thing apart and really look at the rotor and everything. But the other part of me doesn't want to mess up my 
friend's generator if all I need to do is just fix a wire. So yeah, let me take these wires off and I'm gonna get a good look at everything in here. And I do notice that this one ran down underneath. I wonder why they did that. Why not keep it in the box like the rest of them? Here you can see that broken insulation. More there. Looks like it might have been chewed on. More there. So I've got this small gauge. What would that be doing? That's sending power to something. That is probably sending power when the generator is making power over to the control box. That's what that's doing. Uh, the only thing is the red wire is connected to neutral because why wouldn't it be? So this is the wire going to the other leg. It has a protective thing on it. So I guess a critter must have uh, attacked this thing. So this is the only problem I'm finding so far. Maybe not. You guys see that? I hope that lighting's good enough. That right there looks like a little case for a fuse and it looks burnt inside. Which, given what I found, oop. although a wire shorted against the block is already kind of a smoking gun, and a fuse with infinite resistance is also kind of a smoking gun. <laughs> Nada. This is a free little app that I use quite a bit because I can't see like I used to. Yeah, this is in the app store uh, called Maglite. And uh, it's pretty, pretty handy. Seeing things up close, you can adjust the lighting and you can adjust the magnification. I looked closer at that fuse and it was actually a T5AH. And the H means slow blow. I ordered some, those are on the way. And I've looked at this thing further. There's definitely evidence of a critter living in here. And I'm pretty confident that those are chewed wires. So I'm probably good fixing that and replacing the fuse, but I think there may be some other chewed wires in here. Let me show you. See that? That's a bunch of acorns. And right above that are the stator wires that I'm a little... It's hard for me to see. It's hard for me to show you. But I'm a little uh, worried about the state of them. So I think I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to go ahead and fix this wire. Wait for the fuses to get here. But I don't think that's the end of this repair. Funny how you do that knowing you're gonna hurt your hand. You do it anyway. I'll just make a new one of these. like acorn shells. I think I was fooling myself and I uh, saw wire damage. I don't, I don't see anything now. And the ohm testing was good. The stator's fine. How, do, how can I tell this is a brushless generator? The diodes on the rotor right here. That's only gonna be on a brushless setup. Now, I've also gone around and put this in diode check and checked each diode, and I'll do these here. There, I'm in diode check. And you want these to be around 0.5, which that one is. And 0.5 again. And I've checked all of them, they're all the same. 
Another thing for us idiots, you know, this rotor here, I don't know what the ohm reading should be on it, but you have a lot of different points here that you can measure. So the two diodes come to a center point. If I go to the center point to one of the other ones, I'm getting 2.4 mega ohms. And if I do it the opposite direction, 2.6. If I reverse my leads, it might change a little bit because there's a diode there. Yeah, 2.4. I've gone around the entire thing and all of them measure the same. Now, if I go from the outside connection to the outside connection, I get 10 ohms, 10.3. And again, all of them are the same. So it's symmetric. Even though I don't know the ohm readings, I'm pretty confident that the rotor is fine because I'm not finding anything that's out of the ordinary. So at this point, once I get my fuse, I'm gonna put this thing back together. We're gonna to see if it works. If it does, great. If it doesn't, then I think the automatic voltage regulator would be the most promising thing to try changing. It's all potted. It's not like I can really change out any of the components. While we're waiting, I wanna look at a brush generator. So here we have a little portable generator. This is a 5,000 watt. You've seen this before when I changed out the carburetor. I've never been into this, and I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a brushed version, but we'll find out. All right, so what type is this, brushed or brushless? Well, it's brushed. Now, this is an old generator. Um, you're not gonna see this kind of setup, at least in my experience, on the newer stuff. Here are your slip rings, and here are your brushes right there. What I don't see on here is a voltage regulator. I think we just have, we've got a capacitor and some diodes. So yeah, here's the rotor. See the coils there. Slip rings, brushes. That's the 120 volt outlet. That's the 240 volt outlet. So here's your stator coil. So you can see that generator works. It puts out pretty dirty power. The engine still doesn't run right. It searches up and down when there's no load. It does better actually under load. Yeah, the Hertz is bouncing around. The voltage is bouncing around and there's no AVR on it. This is now my backup backup generator since I installed the Generac whole house generator. So thankfully I can just put this thing in storage and probably never use it again. <laughs> well, that was an absurd amount of time to wait for a fuse. I wanted to get the right fuse. This is a slow blow fuse. And, you know, could I have gotten away with a regular one? Probably, and it probably wouldn't have hurt anything even if it did blow, but I had other stuff to work on, so I thought it was better to wait and get the right thing. Let's put that in. Now I just need to put all the wires back where they belong. Okay, got them all hooked up. I think we're ready to give this thing a try. So I've got this hooked to the 240 volt out. We're gonna start it like this. We'll be able to see the rotor spin. We can check the voltage and we can check the Hertz here. Well, let's see what it does. I know that was really obvious on video, but I just wasn't looking at that spot when it happened, so I didn't see it. So I'm really curious to see if this flu fuse blew again. Answer yes, no continuity. So I decided to disconnect everything but what is absolutely necessary. There could be a short somewhere else in one of these wires going into the fuse box or who knows what. I've got the voltage sensing to the AVR. I've got the exciter winding, those are still connected, and I've got the two legs. So now's a good time to point out that this generator is wired with a universal AVR. Most portable generators are not done this way. I don't know if this is common for a standby generator, but there's only four wires here. There's two that go to the field, and those are the voltage supply to the rotor to create the magnetic field. And then there's two that hook to the stator windings. So those actually get their power from the stator to supply power for the AVR, and at the same time are used to sense the voltage and determine if any adjustments are needed. And that being said, I think these two wires that aren't used are probably the pilot exciter. 
So this generator could be used with multiple different types of automatic voltage regulators. Set up like this, since it's not using the pilot exciter, it relies on residual magnetism in the rotor to start the magnetic field. And sometimes generators, if they sit too long, will lose that magnetism and will need to be flashed. But that's getting beyond the scope of this video. All right, new fuse going in. Probably burn it right up, but uh, let's see what happens. Well, I saw a spark come flying out of that thing. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the problem, but I really tend to think it is. Yeah, and I just verified that fuse is also blown. I actually saw the sparks fly like from this side. Let me disconnect that uh, AVR, get a closer look at it. Maybe that chewed wire fried something in that thing, it needs to be replaced. Part number. Interesting, that spark shot up from this side, but I don't see anything there. All right, looking at this closer, I think I do see evidence of uh, arcing. Yeah, so it's arcing right down here, right around this MOSFET. I'm highly suspicious that this is our problem. So let me go price a new one. My old one, I was connected F negative and positive are the field and B and C because that's how it's typically set up when you're doing 240 volt power. So new one, it's a redesigned board obviously. You can see it's quite different than the heat sinks and everything, but uh, the controls and the connections are actually all the same. We've got field negative, field positive, those are the same. We have two B connections and they've got A and B jumped together. You know, and actually now that I look at the old one, look at that, they're jumped together right there too that little tab. So yeah, they're, they're not any different. Some little issues here. The holes on the new regulator are wider, so they don't fit into the holes that were on this plate from the previous one. So I'm gonna need to do something about that. And then this heat sink is on the back and they recommended that this be mounted vertically like that so that the heat can radiate up off of it. Well, that's not gonna be possible in this enclosure but I think it would definitely help to raise this up a little bit so that there's some air space underneath it. I'm gonna make a new plate, space it off half an inch and get it up there. And then also the old one had ring terminals and these are these push type connectors. So I'm gonna to need to put new ends on the wires. So let's get that done. So this was quick and easy, but before I do the spacers, uh, I'm going to go ahead and test this thing. Kind of silly to do all this work if it's not going to help. I think that's looking pretty good. We are set up. AC volts, and I've got jumpers to both legs. I've made sure nothing's shorted out. Assuming we get decent voltage, I can check the hertz just by hitting that button. Kind of see where we are. Over here, I added a switch so that I can use this to turn it on and off because, uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to turn it off. <laughs> Let's go turn the propane on and give this thing a test.
that's awesome. Awesome for my friend and also, uh, <laughs> I was thinking, man, I'm gonna have to like really rip into this thing if it doesn't, um, which would be fine, I would do it. But if I had to really rip the stator apart, I'm not real confident I'd be able to fix this thing. And he was not interested in buying a new power head. I don't know, I guess maybe, uh, maybe if it hadn't, I could buy a new power head and then sell the generator. But it works, it works flawlessly. Uh, now I'm gonna need to, I need to set it up so that we can load test this thing. Now, I'm not gonna be able to take it to 15,000 watts, but uh, we can put it under some load, see what happens. So the grid voltage here, is usually around 250, uh, 252. So yeah, I need to turn that up a little bit more. And obviously the Hertz is 60. All right, a couple more things I need to do before I can get all this closed up. I need to adjust the stability setting. That's what this stab is right here. You have to use an analog multimeter. It's monitoring the voltage of the field winding. This is the field that's being sent to the rotor that makes it into an electromagnet and the, the regulator adjusts that field to compensate for any changes in voltage. And basically, I should see on an analog multimeter, I should see some flicker in the needle of that field winding. And what I wanna do is adjust the stability to where the flicker is the, the least amount it can be. It affects how quickly it's gonna to respond to a change in, in voltage. So if it's sitting there at 250 volts, you put a big load on it, it drops down to 230, how quickly is it gonna pull it back up? And if you set it too low, then it's gonna be very slow and sluggish and your, your equipment's not gonna like that. If you set it too high, then it's gonna be flicking the voltage around all over the place. It's not gonna like that either. So this is finding that happy medium. You know what, change of plan on the spacers. I don't wanna push this thing up against the top plate and then the wires have to do a sharp bend and you just risk shorting something out. What I realized, there's a lot of airflow in this compartment, but this is blocking it all. So I just need to cut out right around the bottom there. So this is what's wrong with this generator. This hole is big enough that apparently, I guess a mouse can fit through that. Uh, it probably can. This needs hardware cloth, uh, like a quarter inch mesh, something that nothing is gonna be able to get in there. I don't think you'd wanna put like window screen because that would restrict your airflow too much, but you've gotta do something on there. Now that I look at it, that's probably our offending hole. So yeah, I think the, uh, the end story on this one really is quite an easy fix. A mouse chewed a wire, it shorted, and burnt up the voltage regulator. Fix the wire, put in a new regulator, good to go. Okay, I've got a bit of a rig here. I'm not gonna go into details, but I'm powering my entire shop with the generator. Right now the power's off, and the only source of power to this shop is this generator. In order to load test this thing, I would have had to wire up this huge contraption it's a lot easier to just plug it into the shop and then I can run cords to all the different things that I'm gonna be using to load test it. Mostly space heaters. I've got 3000 watts right there. I've got just under 3000 watts right there. I've got another 1500 here. And then I'm gonna charge both of these power stations uh, and that will be another 3300 watts. So actually that's the first load I'm gonna do is charging both of those. 
this will bring me to 4700 and we'll see how the voltage is doing how the Hertz is doing and then we'll add another 3000 and then this puts us at like 10,700 will be the total wattage plus a little bit you know I've got batteries and stuff charging in the shop that will be energized by this so right around 11,000 watts will be the max load I'm putting on it. This is gonna give us a voltage readout and then I can also check the Hertz because I expect as I load it up, the Hertz is gonna come down a little bit. This thing should be able to easily handle 11,000 watts. It's a 15 kilowatt generator, not even getting close to its capacity. Let's see what happens here. Air is gonna be in the line, so it might take a little while and then I'm gonna have to turn that breaker on. Well, it handled that like a champ, 11,000 watts and it didn't even flinch. I think the engine speed could be turned down a little bit to try to get it closer to 60 hertz when it's under load. But I don't want to keep fooling around with it. The way I have this set up is not exactly an ideal uh, way to be loading up a generator of this size. Uh, once we get it properly wired into a building and can load it properly, I'll go over and help my buddy and get this thing set so that it's making the right voltage and making the right hertz uh, when it's under a moderate expected load. I was actually surprised the voltage was climbing as I went under load, so I might need to turn that down a little bit too. But uh, we'll sort that out later. The purpose of this was to see if it, is it really fixed? Is it going to be able to handle load? And absolutely, yes it can. It's fixed. So there you go, guys. Generators. Really simple, right? <laughs> no, there's one thing this repair taught me is generators are complicated. There's a lot of different setups. There's a lot to know. And in doing my research for this video, I discovered another YouTuber uh, named James Condon. Uh, he has a great channel. He knows a lot more about generators than I do. So if you want to expand your generator knowledge and how to repair them, especially portable generators, go check his channel out. I'll leave a link. Uh, he also is an excellent small engine mechanic. I got a lot more stuff in the works. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.